Hi, and uh, welcome back, or welcome if this is the uh, first time you've joined us today, for our second panel discussion uh, of today's proceedings. Um, this morning in our first session, we had a fantastic discussion about the challenges and suggestions for bringing energy to our leadership practice and learned actually that law doesn't have to be dull, um, but you'll have to watch the recording to, uh, to find out what that's all about. Um, we're now going to move on to the currently critical topic of talent acquisition and retention. Um, we're in unprecedented times. Uh, in the second quarter of 2021, the UK retail industry lost 89,000 jobs compared to the same period a year ago. However, in the summer months, retail job vacancies passed the 1 million mark for the first time ever. So, you know, within that, there are very obvious skills shortages. Whether the cause has been the pandemic and or Brexit or competition from other sectors, what most retailers now face is the challenge of innovatively finding and hanging on to great people. My name's Paul Deeprose. I'm the founder of The Career Gym. We help leaders and their teams to give their careers a great workout. Um, and I'm joined by a fantastic panel of experts today who have a real breadth of experience to share in this subject of acquisition and retention. So I'd like to introduce them to introduce themselves. Um, so in no particular order, um, Pauline, I would wonder if I could ask you to uh, go first and just say a few words about who you are and, and what you do currently, please. Yes, yeah, so I'm Pauline Whiteman. Obviously, I work for the Walt Disney Company. Uh, but the area of the business that I actually support in HR is the stores, the Disney stores and the Shop Disney, as well as the distribution side of the business. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, next, we've got uh, Maddie Scott uh, from Groupon. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Maddie. Um, I am a talent development partner at Groupon, so working across um, the whole business. So it's a global team um, and currently still working from home. So I do apologise. There are some builders across the street, so uh, <laughs> hopefully that won't be too noisy. <laughs> I think we're all used to those interruptions <laughs> by now. So uh, thank you very much, Maddie. Uh, Phil, if I could ask you to uh, to go next. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Phil Vickers. I'm the HR director for Charles Tirrett, who are a menswear retailer. Where we've got stores both in the UK and the US, and a strong online presence as well. Super. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, next on my list is Emma. Hi everyone. So I'm Emma James. I am Head of Internal Communication and Colleague Engagement at Moto Hospitality. For those of you who don't know, that's the, the UK's biggest motorway services company. Um, so I've been here a year, but five years prior to that, looking after the same subjects at Merlin Entertainments. And I too am at home, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Thank you very much, Emma. And uh, last but not least, Kirsty, uh, if I could ask you to introduce. Hi everybody. Kirsty. Yeah. Thank you. Really pleased to be here. Um, my name is Kirsty Greeny from uh, Elucidat. I'm the head of customer learning at Elucidat. My background is in learning design. I've been a learning designer and consultant for 15 plus years, often working on sort of large blended uh, behavior change initi initiatives with um, large organizations. So Elucidat, in case you don't know, is an award-winning platform that is aimed for um, enterprise scale organizations to produce their own e-learning in-house quickly and easily. And we work with some of the largest retailers um, in, in this country, but also in the world. So we work with Tesco, Kingfisher, Benefit, lastminute.com, and some of the largest US grocers. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, yeah. So um, welcome to you all. Thank you very much indeed for, for coming on, onto the panel. Um, to our delegates, just a, a quick reminder that you can post questions uh, during the course of our discussion. Please feel free to do that in the chat function. Uh, we will get to those probably at the end of the session. Uh, and uh, the session will be recorded and uh, the link for that will be distributed uh, after today's event. May I just start the conversation, Phil, uh, by, by coming to you, uh, if I may. Um, Tirrett has been in the press, like so many others, on a bit of a roller coaster journey uh, through the last 18, 19 months. Um, but I wonder whether I could ask you to, to briefly share your COVID journey with us and then sort of lead that through into 
um, you know, how you're now looking at, at attracting talent to your business. Yeah, I think it's one of those where uh, putting the last 18 months into anything brief is always challenging. And I'm sure uh, <laughs> as everyone listening will have gone through tremendous journeys, because I think, you know, what I've reflected on, and I'm sure everyone's reflected on speaking to other colleagues, is it's a very different journey for different companies and different people in the retail sector. So there were some areas that did incredibly well that really benefited and, and, and kind of, you know, were in the right place to, to kind of grow their sales during the, uh, during the pandemic and provided great services and kind of online uh, side of things. And then there were others who, who had a much tougher time. Um, and I would put us, you know, in the more, in the, in the latter camp of that. So as a menswear formal retailer, so selling shirts, suits as our, our kind of primary uh, business model you know, to those men going into work in the offices you can imagine that when everything started to shut down it was a difficult market to be in and, and a challenging place to be in. and ultimately as you know as many people had to we had to make some difficult decisions around you know people going on to furlough or stores closing and opening a number of different times um equally we've got a presence in both the uk and the us and so it was interesting having to face into the challenges of what was happening in the UK, but equally um, in, in the US as well, where it's a very different employment model and thinking about the engagement of those colleagues where, you know, things like healthcare, actually, if they're not working, they don't get it. Um, so we made some decisions to, to ultimately continue to pay for people's healthcare during a, a health pandemic. So there were lots of those things and decisions that you had to do to think about how you, how you step through them in the right way in a very unknown situation. Um, for us as a business, though, what we what we had to really focus on was, you know, as I said, to start with, uh, as a formal retailer, it wasn't really going to be selling huge amounts of shirts and so on during that time. So we, we had to quickly pivot our strategy to be more about Zoom casual. Um, so that was very much around you know, selling polo shirts and, you know, as I'm wearing today, are, are kind of more or less formal shirts and all, all those types of things, which actually did tremendously well during lockdown, you know, as, as men wanted to kind of dress a bit less formally. Um, but equally, it's put us in a really good place now for us as things are starting to improve and so with sales now starting to ramp up and people going back to the office we're seeing a really buoyant time actually and I think all the work we did during the pandemic where it was it was tough and challenging to right size the business it's now um, put us in a good position but you know we are now in the in the the good position with the challenge of trying to get enough people into the business um, which is very much you know I'm sure facing lots of people at the moment but trying to attract people to come and work in our stores and then you know retaining those good people is, is a real is a real challenge and that's both in the UK and the US at the moment. And, and how did the balance of your business change between obviously the, the high street and, and online during that period? Yeah, so we, um, as a business, we were in a very good position in that we were 70-30 uh, online to retail before the pandemic. So actually we were more of an online retailer than, um, than bricks and mortar. Uh, so you can obviously imagine that during that time, it effectively went to you know, 19, 100% uh, online for periods of time. So we were in a good place where actually we had a strong e-commerce offering and, and a really great platform there, which um, you know, meant for a period of time that that was our lifeblood. That's what kept us going. Uh, you know, had our distribution center open throughout and our, our fantastic colleagues there kept, you know, COVID safe environment, but worked extremely hard to, to kind of keep servicing all our sales. And, you know, we did tremendously well, but, you know, the, the stores are always the, the kind of the way people look into our brand and so without them it was it was you know, it was difficult and you know that kind of multi-channel journey it, it kind of did suffer from that side but you know, now with our stores open we're starting to see that that pick up again which is nice okay lovely thank you um emma if i, if I could move to you um we, we just talked about brand there as well being important you're in a you know the slightly different sector i suppose of of, of the sort of crossover of hospitality as well How, how's it affected you and what is the the sort of talent acquisition landscape looking like for you at the moment i mean it's tough like you said we're a mixture with motorway services retail hospitality we're kind of a, a hybrid and it's a really competitive marketplace especially when you look at things you know we have added challenges like lack of public transport things like that so we've tried to instead look at our employer value proposition as everybody talks about but really breaking down who are we who are, who are our best workers who are the colleagues that really want to join us for example we have a lot of parents or students who like the flexible hours of being a 24 7 business they like the fact they can do night duties so what we've tried to do is really hone in on who are our audience and what appeals to them what is the parts that they look at and go that's why i want to be there and ultimately, a big part of that for us is still the brands. You know, as much as Moto isn't such a known brand, the brands that work within us, like Costa, like KFC, like Greg's, we don't, we're not blind to the fact that some people really want to build the loyalty and the pride within those brands as well. Um, so I think it's often about really understanding the personas, the audience you're after, and what appeals to them, which might be different to somebody else. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and 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 um, if I ju just just very quickly move to you, Pauline. Um, again, we're talking about sort of brand loyalty and things. I mean, you work for an iconic brand. There has your brand been, um, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of, a, I suppose, something that has played to your real benefit over this period, or I don't say a hindrance, but but you know, has it actually played out in a different way to you? I think we've still experienced the same challenges as any other business um, because obviously the Walt Disney Company as a whole was affected because if you look at the, the whole of the, the Walt Disney Company, you've got the parks and resorts, which had to shirt. You've got all the different. So we obviously our films, no one was going to the cinemas, um, sports events, they weren't happening. So it, it affected all parts of the Walt Disney Company, not just retail, but obviously retail with the same. A lot of the focus was on shifting to the e-commerce side as opposed from the the bricks and mortar stores because we had no choice to do that um we had kept our distribution center open the same um and um, as, as phil said but it's been a very challenging time because um you know the the experience that people have normally going into a store we sort of pride ourselves on on that great guest what we call great great guest service and it was difficult to maintain that through a website so we've had to look at our different strategies to do that so let's talk about those talent acquisition strategies. Um, Emma, if I can just come back to you, have you had to change your strategy fundamentally to stand out from the crowd and therefore attract people back into your brand? I think it's still a journey we're on. I don't think it's something that you can do overnight as much as I wish it was um, in terms of we've definitely been looking at what makes us different, what helps us stand out, looking at our benefits. But it is a bit of a journey to get to that point and to talk to our existing colleagues and find out what they love, because it's not always what you as a management team think is the way to look at things so that's been interesting sorry the, the challenges of your phone ringing on your desk when you're on a on a zoom call um so i do think we've adapted i do think we've looked at um different techniques i do think we've looked beyond just the local community as well i think people are willing to travel a little bit further for a job that they believe in and one thing we're really harnessing on is our culture what are we about and why do people want to work for us most of our colleagues are quite young we get quite a lot of quite young frontline staff and to them, especially that culture being a part of something that's got a bigger purpose. So we spent quite a lot of time really understanding our purpose, what we're a part of and sharing with our existing colleagues, our plans for the future in terms of sustainability, community engagement. And that seems to be getting having a really positive effect. OK, so and I think I was just going to build on that, if that's OK, Paul, because mm -hmm. I think I think you hit on a really great point there, which is that around I do think what people are looking for from work now on the other side of the pandemic has changed. And I know, you know, probably all facing the same things, but what people are kind of quite the questions we're getting and getting asked are the different ones to what they were perhaps pre pandemic when people are wanting to know about our employment offer. And, you know, as you say, kind of trying to share that culture and talk about how important that is and the great things you do. Um, and things like the work-life balance, hybrid working in, in offices, you know, all those things now are, are actually kind of rather than peripheral conversations towards the end of an interview that you tend to find, you know, as you're trying to attract people that they're coming right up front. So, um, you know, there's definitely a shift there in how you kind of elevate some of those practices. And, you know, to your point about putting things out you know, on your websites or talking about your CSR agenda, you know, tremendously important now. Hello, yeah, I agree. So, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was just going to back up what Phil said. I think we've been quicker to respond in our central office roles in a way because it's easier to respond to that flexible working mm. in that environment where we where it's harder sometimes is those frontline retail and, and hospitality teams to be able to respond to that and get that message out there. But you know, I use myself as an example. I'd, I'm not sure that two or three years ago I'd be in the role I am now two or three hours drive away from my head office, working flexibly from home with a young family working four days a week. Would the business have looked at that? I think in a way, the world we've been in for the last year or two has actually pushed businesses to embrace that different type of working. So try and take a silver lining there. Yeah, so I was just going to sort of more or less say the same thing. So the, the shift of the strategies focus on flexibility, but also ethics and, uh, as Phil said, reputable damage, uh, reputable brand um, about corporate responsibility, DNI, all the things that people look so people want to be like minded people feeling that they truly belong um, and they can be themselves in, in an organisation. Um, so they're the key things that we've we sort of started to focus on, because, like you say, the people are aware of the brand, but just making sure that those things are considered. I, I totally buy into to all, all of that, of, of course, and this whole concept of purpose and putting it out there. Um, 
the question a lot of people have is, but how do you make that live and breathe? You know, how do you convince people it really is there as opposed to it just being the, the apocryphal poster on the wall? Um, so I, I wonder whether any of you might be able to share your story as to how you've allowed that to come to life through this period to attract people to your brand with it being real as opposed to just a, a marketing uh, principle. So we've, we've obviously um, got a program that's called Disney Belong um, and therefore the senior leaders are part of that um, where we've got different bergs within the, the organisation like Disney Pride, Women at Disney, um, Disney D D Diversity, so different groups that people can actually speak to the senior leadership and it's coming from the top that are part of them um, and they can talk to people in their real life stories and see their journeys so that it's not just words, it's actually real life examples, which we're finding help with that journey. Okay. We've been doing similar, Pauline, in terms of that um, diversity and inclusion side of it. We've had we've got steering groups, we've got colleague discussion groups in those different areas where we know we can improve, try and really get that conversation going. But in terms of living and breathing it, for me, it's also seeing our leadership live and breathe this stuff. And mm. so, for example, the fuel crisis recently has been huge for us um, and our fuel forecourts team has been very overwhelmed. We've had some of our senior leadership stepping in, marshalling on the sites, um, the same during peak season time when we've been busy with COVID stuff seeing that senior leadership step in and help I think really shows we're living and breathing our values and our and our approach thank you um Phil any any comment on that have, have you and especially as you sort of you know you've got the international aspect as well as, as obviously you have as well Pauline but does, does that make a difference to, to what you're doing in in that whole purpose space yeah it is it, it, it does and echoing what people have said I think it's about how you how you try and talk about it one of the things that works very well for us actually is things like refer a friend so actually you know simple mechanisms to, to draw people in um again you know in the us we're not as we're not as big a brand or as well known you know we're more mainly kind of east coast and you know so you don't necessarily get the cut through on on job boards and those things so actually internal referrals and people talking about it to their friends and, and what they enjoy about working there you know that, that's really important you know, equally it's then using the channels you've got you know, the likes of linkedin and, and your kind of internal websites or external websites should i say to to highlight perhaps some of those testimonials and, and kind mm. of talk about some of those opportunities where you know we're, we're very good at promoting people internally and, and kind of giving those opportunities so on our recruitment site we've got some testimonials from people about how they've been able to climb through the business and i think you know all you can do is try and drop those you know those moments in and hope that people do do believe that the, the hype almost if, and what you're talking about but you know generally you, we do find when people get in the it, it's true we've not sold, we've not missold the dream as it were it, you know our culture is, is actually what we do as spouses as, as well yes indeed Kirsty um I, I know that uh, you and Maddie are sort of more on, on the retention side we will come to but uh do you have something to offer at this moment yeah I was just going to echo really what, what Phil said I think what we're seeing a lot of um, customers doing what uh, we try to do ourselves as well is catch some of those day in their lives or the kind of stories what you don't want to do is wait until glass door reviews come about because you don't know what they're going to be like and it's a bit too late uh, by that point so you want to capture um really have an advocacy program a bit like you might have for customers but for employees too and try and get the champions or the people who are very engaged with your organization to kind of share their stories and um, there's many tools and resources to be able to do that but you know using things like linkedin but also making them available to people who are applying for jobs um you know why wait until they come to an interview even let them, see them, let them access them so it's almost like pre-boarding much, much earlier, you know, like then I think maybe might have happened before to engage people with that purpose. But I think through storytelling is a really good approach that we've seen. Yeah. How much have you had to change recruitment practices? Um, we've got skills shortages out there. And if you read the, you know, some of the press, there's, there's a lot of criticism of people just bringing people into the organisation, finding they're not quite so good as they thought and clearly getting rid of them. Now, I'm not suggesting any of your organisations are in that camp, but there's a temptation to bring people in a little bit too quickly. Um, the world has changed. Organisations have had to shift. What has changed within your recruitment practices, uh, if anything, to ensure that you are still working at the top level in your talent acquisition? Um, Emma, perhaps we can start with you. I think for us, I know that Kirsty talked about pre-boarding, but onboarding as well for us has, has been really, really key. And our recruitment 
teams, um, how do I word this, words, they do almost two levels of interview. One is an interview about the person and the role and the other is the interview around our values and how that person matches into our values. Because, you know, you can teach people basic skill sets around how to run a KFC or how to make a coffee in Costa. You can't change somebody's core persona, their core values. So I think we've really focused on that. Um, and I do think as well, we focused a lot on finding other people within um, our sites and our units who, who match those same values. So if we've got somebody working in our KFC who's a working mum, Again, it's back to that refer a friend, finding more people that are similar to those who are doing a great job now um, mm -hmm. and trying to harness those. And I think the fact that we have such strong brand relationships with our BK and Costa, they have to go through quite rigorous brand training before they can meet the customer because of our customer service standards. So I think we do avoid some of that speed just by the neg negation of the process that we go through. OK, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I like the ways of that partnership side that you have with them obviously is a is almost a double process so the standards re remain that that at that very high level um pauline do, do, what are your thoughts on recruitment practices yeah well we've changed them over the time anyway because um we wanted to make sure that people they didn't necessarily have to have the skills in retail that they had the passion like you say for the brand and the knowledge because for, particularly in the disney stores it's about you know you're not just selling a bear you're selling willie the pooh who lives in 100 acre woods and yes there's a store behind it and we want that connection because hopefully that's what makes it different and why people want to go in our stores and we have a more of a practical um interview process where um we call it an in-store familiarization where it's not just about someone talking the talk but it's actually walking the walk and seeing how they do engage with people and we call it on stage which is our shop floor um engage with people and you know whether they've got that connectivity and like you say you can train basic skills on how to use tools and things like that it's having that passion really um for the brand and the product yeah and, and do you subscribe to, to the concept of, of open hiring so you're, you're hiring for attitude and you train the skill yeah, to to degree, yeah. So we you know we have sort of like the core the core skills that we, we they focus on. But yeah, it is it is about the like you say the passion and the ability to feel free that they can you know have conversations with people and because some people are just we just employ as meters and greeters so that they're welcoming people to to the store. So there's different people. Obviously, we look at different skill sets, but yeah, we are quite open to to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Phil. I was just going to say to you, your broader question about have we had to change hiring practice and those things. I think some of it is just about thinking about the levers you have at your disposal and which ones you pull. Um, and, and by that, I mean, there's things like at the moment, it, you know, we're, we're kind of working alongside the kickstart scheme um, to see if there's, there's the government funded initiative where you can uh, kind of bring people in and, and effectively give um, you know, generally more young people an opportunity in, uh, in into businesses and roles. So, you know, there's avenues there. We, we also partner with um, the Prince's Trust is our, is our kind of charity that we work with. Um, and through them in the past, we've we've you know, hired people in uh, and kind of given opportunities through their recruitment schemes. And so we're looking at that at the moment as well. And then you know, equally things like the um, apprenticeship schemes at the moment. So you know, our distribution centre is, is a real you know, real challenge at the moment. It's such a hot market for distribution centres at the moment. So you know, we are looking at what we can do and working with our apprenticeship provider to see who we can bring in from there. Because again, you know, you're likely to get 12, 18 months out of that individual as they grow their career and hopefully, you know, can then rise into, into management type roles. But ultimately you, you get perhaps a longer period with that person so i think you know for all these things it's about some of it isn't revolutionary it's just thinking about the different levers you might have used before and, and kind of dusting them off uh, and, and kind of pulling on those again and using your partnerships because you'll find there's companies you work with or have worked with that, that can help in this space and, and so just think about who you have perhaps in your network that you can that you can use i, I like the concept of, of not having to be revolutionary and, and then just evolving what you've done and dusting a few things off um, mm. Although innovation clearly is, is a good thing and it's been necessary over, over the last few years, is there anything that you have done that you would consider has been very innovative and has, has fundamentally changed the way that you, you've found people or hired people? Um, I, I would love to say there was. I would love to say, yeah, there's this really crazy thing that we've done. Actually, it hasn't. It's been it's been down to a lot of hard work and effort from from the recruitment teams, from you know, making sure they source the right people, they target the right areas, they um, you, you know double down when we're trying to you know trying to hire into certain key roles. So, I don't for us personally, it hasn't been anything revolution from that side. You know, from the recruitment side, it's been about you know I think as Emma was saying before, you know, great practice of you know making sure your interview looks at both the what and the how, so what people have done, but equally how they've done it. So 
you know you kind of bring in that in to make sure you require you, you, know, you bring in the right people um yeah as i say you know you might be advertising in different spaces or kind of looking at different things and um, highlighting your benefits more so again we're, we're talking more about hybrid working now and you know in retail at the moment you know, we offer a, a, a good bonus scheme for people so you know where our pay you know our pay rate is it's going to be in line with others actually we offer a good bonus scheme so you know, we're trying to talk about some of those bits that perhaps before wouldn't have been um as well known or as highlighted you know how do you bring them further up the job advert you know how do you make them closer to the top so that that's the first thing people see and, and kind of draws them in uh, and then you can you can land some of the other bits later on so um yeah it's not necessarily revolutionary kind of something mm -hmm. super different but it's just about as i say thinking and, and just sometimes it's tweaking and playing with things and, and just seeing what works and doesn't work you, you know there's no harm I mean, sometimes just trying something a bit different um, yeah. you know we've advertised roles without hours without hours attached to them and so basically said we're looking for retail people and and you know you don't say that you just see what people can do um and sometimes you know that can that can work out really well sometimes you find you don't get the hours that you're looking for but you know you might might meet some kind of real great sellers who you can bring into the business i love that idea yes and anyone else feel that they've got anything that that is just that little bit evolutionary if not revolutionary that they've introduced <laughs> to the business I think um, I'm definitely not an expert on the recruitment side and very much more in the talent development side. And so I might not be able to expand on this point much at all. <laughs> but I know that um, from our recruitment team are working really closely with our diversity, equity and inclusion team. And they're sort of moving from that idea of culture fit to culture add. Um, and I think, you know, when we're thinking about development, we're thinking about how can we make this most appropriate to this individual in that specific situation and I think that's probably across the whole of the talent space just thinking about how can we help this individual feel like they're going to be appreciated and developed and you know given opportunities um based on sort of you know what they bring to the role and of course there's going to be some things that that need to be there to, to Pauline's point um but I think kind of really focusing on that individual and thinking well, what can they bring to the company um you know even over and above what's what's in a job description perhaps I love that I love that idea yes mm. yeah I think for us, one thing, again, not revolutionary, maybe it's something we're on an evolution to is looking a little less at nationwide recruitment advertising and looking back to that engagement with our local communities around our sites, both from the charity and the community angle, but also in terms of the recruitment angle, the more we can build those relationships with the communities, the education around our areas of our sites, I think the more chance we've got of getting, of bringing those local recruits in as well. Okay, thank you. Let me just ask one final question in this acquisition space, really, which is um, you know, the, the, the $64,000 question, really. Those specific roles that are really, really hard to fill, what are you doing to tackle that issue at the moment? Because there are, there are certain roles that are just so difficult to find at the moment, either it's you know, en masse or in your particular business what are you doing either strategically or just purely operationally to fill those difficult roles now I, i'm not going to point it at anyone does anyone have any particular strategies that they're i'm happy to get a bit a starting point so in, in, in some areas we have had to review review pay uh, and so you know there are some areas where you have to be honest you know the, often the first place to start in some ways is you know, making sure you're competitive and it, it is a very competitive market in certain roles and certain places um, and we're finding that very much um and equally in the us actually as well as in the, in the uk it, it's, it's very kind of area specific so in certain areas in new york uh, we found that rates uh, over there particularly have gone up very very uh, kind of quickly recently uh, and there's a real fight for talent and so we had to make a, a judgment call to, to increase pay rates so you know, that's not always the most palatable measure or, or, or the kind of one you want to have to pull on because there's, there's impacts and, and implications of that but you know that is always a place to start is, is mainly just to check are you competitive you know is it competitive and, and kind of in line with what others are offering um uh, other than that we, you know, we've looked at things like hours you know, where people can, can work from home you know offering the hybrid working and those types of things which you know again is, is i think what a lot of places are offering but we've certainly tried to highlight those more than we perhaps have previously Okay, yeah, and just to build on that, we're just looking at the overall benefits package because some people, it may not be just be the salary, it might be like you say, it might be the healthcare benefits or other benefits that um, you can sort of add on to, to that, that may attract someone that will actually be more um, attractive to certain individuals than others. 
Yes, the whole the overall package is uh, is very important, so especially now when they are looking at the whole flexibility issue as part of a package. Uh, mm. When once it used to just be pensions and things, yeah. Um, any other thoughts on on that side? Um, let me just sort of just what I say add to that slightly or, or turn the coin over. So, what would you advise candidates to do better? to approach you. So there's good people out there, but so many of them, from my experience being a career coach and helping people through outplacement, et cetera, you know, they, they don't uh, sort of present themselves well enough and they may, you may miss them as a consequence of that. So if people were approaching your business, and I put a caveat, this isn't a passport for them to join your business, but, um, you know, but, but what could they do better to make themselves attractive to businesses such as yours? Um, I actually had a recent example. I went down to visit one of our services um, in Devon recently, and they've been looking for new Costa colleagues. And we're really struggling at the interview process because quite a lot of the younger um, recruits were quite quiet in the interview process and they were finding that they couldn't really get to know them. So actually the lady there was really interesting. She turned the interview technique around and started asking them about what interested them personally, just to try and see that other side of them and take them out of that nervous interview kind of persona. Mm. And as soon as they started talking to them about Harry Potter or Lego or whatever it is that interested them, they actually got to see a completely different side. So I would say to to potential um, recruits is you know don't be afraid to open up to show your personality because I think we were really struggling to pull that out of people to be able to see how they would um, work especially on a customer facing role. That's really interesting okay thank you. Any other thoughts for our candidate population who may be uh, watching this? Yeah, so as, as I talked about that in-store familiarisation, we use obviously our product and our films because we try to sort of um, get them to talk about a character or a film or something um, related obviously to the Walt Disney Company. Now we've got Marvel and Star Wars and all those sort of things. So there's quite a broad, doesn't have to necessarily be Minnie Mouse, but try to sort of like talk about a, a product or something or think which, which they've got a passion and why. And it may be a memory from a child or the first film or the first toy they got or something like that, just to get the conversation talking. I think the only thing I would add on that is, um, you know, there are there are a tremendous amount of, of roles out there and a tremendous amount of jobs with, with companies, with good companies out there. Um, I, I think just if, if someone is looking to apply for a role or, or applying for roles, really commit to the brands that you're you're approaching um, and make sure that actually you know, it's where you want to work. And you know, I think that's the, the right approach at any point in time. But, you know, really think about what it is you want to get from your career and why it is that brand and and that you'll, you know, they will perform, you naturally perform better in an environment where you're talking about something or talking to someone that you want to engage with. Um, so, you know, certainly don't, I think the scattergun approach doesn't necessarily work. It can feel like you're getting somewhere, but I don't think it's necessarily the right way to do it. So, you know, you use the sniper rifle and kind of think about exactly which ones you want to and kind of pinpoint those brands because you'll, you'll get more depth and, and do the research on those businesses. Um, there's such an amount online now, which, you know, I think people are nodding around the room. There's, you know, such a, an amount of information for candidates on on websites to, to understand a bit more about a business, you know, really trawl those through first and, and, and kind of think about what it is that makes you want to work there. Lovely, really sound advice. Anyone who works with me knows I have this little phrase, it's knowing what you want and what you offer. And if you can be laser focused on those, then that's mm. your way forward. Um, lovely, Let, let's, let's sort of go on that sort of little transition in, in, into the retention side. Um, and I'd like to do that, if I may, Kirsty, by coming to you. You talked about pre-boarding, I think it was. Um, so, you know, helping people make that transition and maybe you'd like to explain exactly what you mean by that and, and how you help your clients um, to actually work their way through that. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, onboarding itself definitely come into the, the limelight. Um, you know, it's always been part of businesses and needing to onboard people and onboard them quickly to get them productive and up to speed. But now with um, maybe the bringing in of contractors or short term, you know, where you know somebody's only going to be there for a short time, uh, the worry about turnover, then there's a real laser sharp focus on onboarding, I think, again, and trying to think about how you really get across values in that too. So we talked about purpose, so uh, not making it clinical or process based or just that steps, it's got to be, you know, I mentioned Dame Life Stories and how you actually, how does somebody actually do this job in this business and encompass the values in doing it and how do they bring themselves to the job? So I think pre-boarding is an extension of that. So it's about picking out some bits that you can give to somebody 
perhaps they've been hired, but they haven't yet started. So that's what pre-boarding is, is giving them some um, access to some kind of need to know information that's going to make them feel comfortable, is going to help them work out on day one. You know, so there's no surprises, especially if they're working remotely, you know, and you can't go into the office. Um, but I guess what I was talking about earlier is even rolling some of that back even further, you know, pre-hire. If you've got some hot candidates and you want to kind of tempt them in, then take some of those day in the life stories out even further. So yeah, onboarding, you know, lots of our customers, they, 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 they work with us to kind of produce that anyway, but I think there's, it's about being shorter and sharper, capturing stories. Many people are, are getting people, let's say in grocery retail, to go out with, um, you know, give them, a, give them a phone, allow them to go and film what, what they do. How do you actually stack a shelf? I know that sounds maybe a bit silly, but, but why not have someone who does the job show how they do it and talk through it and then capture that and put it in together with some, you know, quick tips and resources to help them. Um, and give it to somebody else before they start, you know, so when they come in, they know what to do. And I'm just going to add to that. I think that that kind of realistic job preview is something that's, that's kind of really important from, like I said, a hiring attraction perspective, because I think it does give people a real sense before they apply, you know, if, if it's a job that they would want to do. Uh, and you know, I think to the point that Emma was making before around, you know, working in a cost or something, actually, what's that feel like? What's that look to, you know, what's that look like on a day to day basis? I think it gives them a real sense of, of how that will be. So that kind of stuff is, is, is really useful. Um, you know, both to attract candidates, but equally for candidates to self-select and, and kind of make sure they're applying for the job they really want again. Yeah. I'll back up what Phil says there as well in terms of if you understand your colleague engagement, if you're doing, for example, a colleague engagement survey, I know back at Merlin, one of the things we identified was that at one year's service, there was a dip in engagement across the whole business. I think that was to do with the expectations of the role in a theme park, doing this, that and the other. I'm sure Pauline will understand this versus then at a year starting to see the realities of what that actually means in terms of how much hard work that is. So we were seeing a mismatch and by doing something like a colleague survey, you can identify where some of those gaps are that you can that you can work on yeah and I'm, I'm baking on what Emma's saying you know people you know see the Disney brand it's all fun they see you know the what um what you see in parks and resorts but there's a lot of hard work that go in the background and some people go into that's why we, this in-store familiarization is really important because people think it's it's all about having fun and we hope that, you know people do enjoy their job and have fun but we still need to sell product we still are a commercial business and um, by having that they have the reality of what it is we still have to stack shelves um, but at the same point in time, you know, there are some really exciting things you know, about the brand and things. And, you know, we do a lot of things in the background and we do a lot of uh, awards with pins and recognitions and things like that um, to so obviously sort of like embrace that. So it's not all monetary, as we talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, Maddie, if I can come to you, um, engagement surveys, et cetera, and, and development, you know, they're obviously intrinsically linked one feeds into the other. I mean, what what do you do to relate the two and, and feed that into the whole retention agenda? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, certainly we do things like lots of companies do. We have like a, a pulse engagement survey and we always encourage our, our managers to, to look at that with their own teams and then also look at it from, from a higher level perspective. Um, but I think we can also use that data plus other data within the organisation to sort of give us an understanding of, of what we need to focus on with our development. Um, I think that that's really important. I think, um, of course, it's possible to just say, what would I like to design right now? And that can be very tempting, um, but actually kind of thinking about what are, what are the problems, what are the issues, what are the things that are coming up for um, our employees at the moment and how can we best sort of match, um, you know, match where people are, hurting or people are feeling the pain um with you know how we want to what we want to design yeah so if you don't mind me asking what are you designing at the moment what's current for your organization <laughs> yeah so um i guess one of the things that's top of mind at the moment um is we've designed some group coaching and um, so this came about for a number of reasons really so uh coaching is obviously a um a relatively common um, intervention or a relatively common thing for people to, to get. Um, we do have the option for one-to-one -one external executive coaching, um, but that tends to have quite a big cost attached to it um, and is only really offered to people at the more senior levels of the organisation. Um, we have quite a lot of talent partners within the team. Well, I say quite a lot, three, three talent partners <laughs> within the team. The population of how many? Uh, so, well, our entire team is five. 
um yeah so um yeah, it's, um, we have three talent partners who can um, do internal coaching, um, but of course that's um, in addition to all of the other things that we're doing as well. So that's obviously, um, there's no cost attached to that, but our resources don't really stretch to being able to, to coach multiple people. Um, but we have really good um, results and really good feedback for when people do engage in coaching. So we know it's something that, that people want because it is that really individual focus. Um, I think workshops are fantastic for lots of reasons, but I think coaching can really help in certain areas because it really does feel very tailored, very, very personal. Um, and so this group coaching idea is sort of um, it's internal so that 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 cost isn't um, on the business or, or on our budget um, but we created group coaching so we could have up to eight people um, having these same conversations and decided to theme them because otherwise we thought that could be quite difficult to know people are gonna usually bring very different goals and very different um, things that they want to work on to coaching and um, so we decided to theme these um, and we've just been piloting it over the summer mm. um, but we themed one on around growing your confidence and one around growing your career um, and that came from various different data points around the business so um, our pulse often tells us that people really want development really want to feel like they're growing um, and also, you know, just being involved in nine block conversations or year end conversations. We know that often um, people want to show up and want to, to feel more confident. Um, and so essentially we just created sort of six sessions where there was some pre-work. We essentially introduced a concept. So, for example, in the Grow Your Career one, we had things like what are your strengths or your values? How do you network? Different topic each week. People did some um, homework sort of around it, trying out, you know, two or three different activities. And then we all came together and then there was a talent partner as a coach sort of facilitating that conversation. Um, but really the focus was on individuals talking about how they found the activities, how they found everything. Um, and also, um, I think one of the benefits of it was it was just cross line of business so people were we grouped it to so there were similar levels in the organization so they had similar um seniority levels but it was across lines of business so people were speaking and talking to people that they wouldn't normally talk to um, mm. and sort of creating that bit of a network which again we know people were struggling with because everyone's working from home and not bumping into people that they don't sort of work directly with at, at the office um, so yeah that's one example Really, really nice, uh, nice initiative, and and the the outputs of that clearly were were a, a bit of well being um, in there as as well as as so performance led as, as well, um, uh, and and so the level of these people, sorry, was is managerial level was it or or was it? Cross, we actually, yeah, we wanted to move away. So, our in the talent development team. Um, we focus on management and leadership training, um, but we are also aware that we have a lot of employees in the company who aren't managers and therefore um, often feel like they're not necessarily as invested in as people who are managers. And so we've actually removed the need to be managing someone. So um, we grouped the we grouped them so we had sort of mid-level um, individuals and sort of director level individuals but we didn't have um anything that said you know you need to be managing people mm -hmm. um because we mm -hmm. just thought there's not really a need for that in this no. in this instance um and we just wanted to kind of open it up a little bit more but we grouped it just so you know we didn't want a senior director in this in this context speaking to someone who was a graduate just because we didn't necessarily feel like they would open up as much um but we did offer it to most levels and in the organization they were just slightly grouped i think in other situations we're, we're trialing out um some reverse mentoring um in one of the programs we're we're um we're designing at the moment so i don't i'm not against like um mixing because i think that um senior people can absolutely learn from from newer people within an organization but in this context we wanted to sort of keep it um at similar levels sure and and from a sort of re retention engagement point of view have you had feedback that actually it's been an initiative positive to that element because you know a lot of people have been on their own as say and not so necessarily sharing their experiences coaching team coaching is slightly different but coaching on its own can be a great way to express yourself in your own particular issues 
but it, to do it in that in that nice forum that you've been doing it is is very different from an engagement perspective i i would think yeah i mean we certainly have got positive feedback from it i suppose we'd maybe as i said we're only piloting so they're quite small numbers um so i'd be a little bit reticent to say we've solved the retention issue guys like these people yeah, are yeah. still here <laughs> um but we're definitely looking to roll it out across the organization um at the start of next year um but yeah got very positive reviews i think people um enjoyed the fact that it was um, very individual so um, you know you were working on things by yourself you were perhaps um, you know, thinking about what your values were and that was individual work um, uh, to, to kind of do by yourself but then you were taking this to other people and I think actually what came out of a lot of the feedback was people were like oh these problems aren't just my own like everyone at this level finds this difficult or everyone at this level is struggling to balance their work and their life um, and so actually just that acknowledgement and that understanding that like everyone's finding this particular thing tough is probably the thing that people took most out of it that was certainly what came up in the feedback most of all just like oh I could talk to people doing a similar role to me and you know everyone it's not just me being rubbish finding everything stressful like you know this is this is something that other people are experiencing as well. Wonderful and, and, and you know, lovely initiative. Thank you. Um, and, and let's stay on that subject because people being remote has been the classic issue over this, this period. Um, what have other people been doing to try and retain people, engage people when the remote issue has been there? How have you enabled people to, to get that sense of belonging, sense of community? Something we put in place, um, sort of COVID started it and we've continued it, is a two weekly business update where our leadership team come on video, they give an update and then they open up to questions from anybody in the business. Um, and those questions really are open to anyone. And that's certainly, I always say it's made it more of a conversation, less of a speech. And I do think that's made a huge difference, um, just introducing that level of communication and visibility of the leadership, even though you can't all be in one place. I think... Um... Yeah we're seeing some sort of similar approaches from from um, customers of ours across across retail so I think um, we've already mentioned purpose which would make what's going to say the four P's because there's a three that are in there but career pathways so pathways um, need to be much more open much more diagonal sideways so things like mentorship sk schemes are absolutely fantastic for that because you allow people to tap into other areas of the business so if someone's an e-commerce data analyst why can't you let them speak to someone who's great at storytelling so they can join up together to work out how to present their findings to the business and professionalizing training. So actually giving accreditation and credits and certificates that are investing in the person rather than investing in the job role. Um, so I think over the last few years, there's been a massive rise of people who are paying for their own um, development outside of work in investing in kind of key skills like communication skills or negotiation skills or data analysis. People are actually going out there looking for it and paying it for it out of their own pocket. If you can give it to them, in your organization and you find the accreditation for them, then they're more likely to stick with you. Um, yes, they might take it with them, but you know, so what? You know, gonna stick around for longer, hopefully. And personalization is absolutely massive. So I think it's come up already in terms of looking. Um, I think Pauline was mentioning it earlier about getting get getting to grips with what people really need. But I think it's not only about what people need or want, which you definitely need to be looking at um, and trying to get personalized with it, but is also how you can actually make their lives easier. And that's where you really need that consultancy focus from L&D professionals. It's not, um, you know, it's about analyzing and listening, but then coming in as a professional to kind of think, well, what's actually gonna make their lives easier and, and find the time then in those jobs for, for developmental learning. Um, I think some, some organizations are also looking at surprise and delight kind of initiatives. So, um, hey, like you can announce what you're doing to the organization. That's brilliant. You should be sharing what you're trying to do and how you're trying to improve things. So some, some organizations are investing in brand new management focused schemes to try and kind of shape that up. because It's one of the reasons people are leaving. Um, but, you know, you can do surprise and delight as well. So imagine if you came into work that day and you've been given, I don't know, free paid for credits where you can go and choose your own course from a menu that's given to you. Um, or um, mentorship scheme have been opened up so you can now go and speak to, I don't know, someone really senior and you're not. Um, you know, there's a little bit of um, giving people things that keep them hooked. It's kind of like putting your marketing hat on, you know, to really keep people going in that continued pipeline, really, which is what they're on. 
and that that's no it's not a linear pipeline it is a it's a you know it's a sprawl it's not like a tree really of them growing and your organization going sideways and, and upwards and across so i think yeah some of the things we're seeing uh yeah just kind of share those Firstly, just to back up what you're saying there, surprise and delight, we do a lot of, and it doesn't always have to cost a lot of money. You know, we, we use the brands we already have at hand. You know, if that's a Marks and Spencer's pack of Percy pigs, because we know that person loves them. And I had a story literally yesterday of um, one of our teams, um, the manager of the site, one of the uh, kids there, uh, younger members of our colleagues was about 17 and had come in and was talking about something. She bought him an ice cream and said he was like the smile on his face. And so we're very big on coaching our managers on sites to understand personalized recognition and the, the benefits of those small surprise and delights or just a thank you note. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. That seems to be really starting to filter through. Yeah. And um um, Pauline, if I can just come to you, I know in, in our pre-chat that uh, you know, your organization has gone through some changes and downsizing. How do you do this retention to your existing staff when all of that is going on in the background, people are losing their, their roles? What, what are you actually doing at the moment um, to keeping people engaged, motivated, productive? Yeah, so it obviously that has been a challenge um, and I don't think there's a one stop answer to it, but it's, it's about, again, sort of engaging the L&D team that we've got. Um, that's obviously a different area, but they are been fantastic about um, putting lots of things forward, like you know, we've got the mentoring going on, but also internal development programs, but not just accredited things, but also people that, that people can access free of charge. Um, that the company are invested in, but also um, well-being, um, things that things that are not necessarily linked to the person's job, so that they can, you know, expand their creativity. You know, learn to draw by one of the special artists that's done a design for a, for a film or something. We luckily we've got those people going, but encouraging people to volunteer for things like that. Um, it gives them satisfaction, but it also engages people and to reignite the, the interest in the brand and, and the future and what, what films are happening and what's happening within the wider, um, sorry, my phone's going, um, wider business. So, um, yeah, so it is difficult, but it's like, like you say, it's a build your own talent pool. Um, which it's, we've got a thing called De Achieve where it's employee led. They can openly tell us where they would like to get exposure to. Um, and we do a lot of secondments where people can trial and go in and have exposure to different parts of the business as well, so that they can hopefully think actually there is a career maybe in a different area. Lovely, yeah. And your phone ringing was me ringing you to try and get an experience with one of your artists, I can tell you. <laughs> um, Great. And so lo lovely if you, you know, if, if you've got those, those facilities, I suppose you can draw on. But that just takes a little bit of thinking and, and, and lateral thinking, I suppose, as, as well. Um, but what if your budgets aren't quite so big? You're a little bit sort of constrained. Maddie, you know, you, you talked about a lovely initiative, um, uh, but, you know, maybe there aren't pots of cash around. I'm not suggesting your, your business is, 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 you know, hard done by, as it were. But if you are on a tighter budget, then, then what, what do you actually do? Or how do you scale these things when, when your budget is a little bit tighter? Yeah, well, I mean, with the example that I gave before with the group coaching, that, that was designed internally. Um, so sort of there, there wasn't any budget sort of assigned to it beyond, obviously, um, <laughs> employing humans. Um, <laughs> But I think I, I, it's difficult, isn't it? Because like you just have to work with what you have. I think if you are lucky enough to have a fantastic, huge budget, great, amazing. Um, you know, we can. There's loads of stuff that that you could do. Um, but also, I think just working within within what you can. Um, you know, that just it was almost like adapting to to reality. Um, so I think being realistic about what you can do and what you can't do. Um, if you don't have any budget and you don't have any resources, or well, you're going to have to pick who do you need to invest in the most or who do you need to develop the most? Like what's your data telling you? What's, um, what, you know, what, what, what's, what's happening in terms of people leaving? Like what level is that? Um, and I think in terms of trying to um, get solutions out there for huge amounts of people while still kind of making it feel like they're being invested in individually. Um, I think that you can target. So for example, we have manager training. So it's just really automatic if you can get your systems working as well, your processes. So it's not so manual. So we're not 
asking HRBPs to nominate people and things like that. If you can just have a really good LMS system in place to say, hey, you've become this manager at this level, you're automatically um, enrolled in this program. That kind of makes life very easy. Obviously, you have to write, have the right people in your team to be able to do that, which we're lucky enough to have. Um, and then I think maybe going specific and going deep with some programs and then also having some stuff that's really broad and saying anyone can can drop into this so anyone can can come to this and it doesn't have to be um a long program it can be one hour um just thinking about you know what are the specific targets and then is there anything you can do and then the final thing is um I think investing, if you don't have a lot of budget, um, I think investing what you do have or investing what time you have in your managers is massively important because although I just said before, you know, we don't want to just be exclusive um, to managers. I do think that if you train those managers up well, they will train their team well. Like I know personally, I've learned so much from managers throughout my career and actually giving them the skills and feeling like they have tools that they're able to use with their teams, that can really help as well. I'd really yeah, sorry yeah. I'm on the back of that yeah so I'm um, don't just because we're you know they're parts of this business we haven't got huge budgets again like when we're talking about the mentoring it's people internally mentoring people internally um that's not a cost um when we're doing about sort of prospects or the TED talks and things we're linking into the resources that are already there um our L&D people are actually delivering and, and training at the managers to to do their own training delivery and things like that so upskilling your own people to do it so that that you have you know you're not relying on outsourcing to to companies where it does incur a big cost you want yeah. to look at reuse as well because of that turnover problem but also because your if your talent's leaving for whatever reason um you know whether it's voluntary or not then you're losing knowledge and experience and so some of the things we've been talking about like mentoring and coaching is you're obviously using that you're not necessarily keeping it so i think also finding ways um to kind of capture that in easy to do ways, in ways that feel like you're still involving that person and sharing their stories, um, uh, you know, giving them easy templates to fill in, whether it's uh, top tips or five steps to do X or something, you know, can, can really help um, or using the mobile phone example like I used before. But I think in terms of um, kind of low cost ways to kind of meet the kind of at scale thing and personalize, which is kind of three sides of a triangle, corners, I don't know, whatever it be, um, then, you know, you. you Lots of technologies have adaptive approaches, so you can you can create one for many, but as they're going through the program, it adapts depending on their needs and, and how they're answering questions. You can use things like smart online diagnostics um, that actually might show things like social polls, so show how other people in a group or in their you know in their in a role group uh, answer the same sort of questions after they've answered them, so they get a feel for things. Um, creating kind of on the job resources that can be used um, stories to kind of uh, look at case studies or interactive case studies and those go really well then with things like coaching and mentoring conversations or lunch and learns or team discussions about them whatever you've got so I think it's about making smart blends and looking at of course you want to engage the hearts because we've got potentially disengaged people who are probably more savvy than they've ever been before and with high expectations so you've got you've got to go for hearts so you've got to have the people focus there you've got to be connecting people but i think you can do use digital resources really smartly to make the blends work um, and and reusable as well well i think that's a lovely way to uh, to probably conclude our our, our conversation we, we have one one question uh, that, that's come in so uh, allow me to to pose this to everybody if i may um how can we target high numbers in brackets thousands of employees, brackets, remote or non-remote, with training, learning, coaching, while engaging them at a personal level. So we've got the blend of, of volume and personal uh, challenge here. So um, may I just ask anyone who'd like to, uh, to answer that? I guess I've just been speaking to that sort of thing, so um, I'll mm. pass on to someone else in a moment, but... Um... You know, it's a tricky one for me to answer because our tool is set up for high scale. So we work with organizations that that are serving hundreds of thousands of employees. And, um, you know, once you've got your solution there, you can adapt it with different languages or you can create different versions of it, different branding and so on. Um, so I don't want to answer it in a way that sounds like I'm going to start like marketing our product. <laughs> but I think my previous answer hopefully gives some answers to that about creating some smart blends that kind of mix good digital resources with um, the, the personal touch, really. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have anything to comment on that? No. 
Okay. Well, look, thank you very much indeed um, to our panelists, um, Pauline, Maddie, Kirsty, Emma. Um, it's been a really great conversation. We, we've covered a whole range of topics. I think, in fairness, we could have gone on for another hour and gone a lot deeper in some of those different areas and answered an awful lot of questions. But um, it's been really in, in, insightful, so some really pertinent areas coming up. So thank you very much, one and all. Virtual round of applause to, uh, to everybody. So thank you from, from all the delegates uh, to, to you each and, uh, each and everybody. Um, so to everyone else, um, we're back on again at three o'clock for our uh, session on well-being. So please come and join us back for that. That. And um, once again, thank you to our panel. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody else who is going to leave us now next year, hopefully in person uh, back in London, 21st of September, that'll be. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody then. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. So bye.